Hello and welcome to Advantu's Recall Prevention Webinar. We're going to walk you through our background, what the deal is with FDA recalls, and then we'll show you how our process helps companies prevent FDA recalls. Are you ready, Charlie? Yes, I'm ready. And before we start, Charlie, could you take a minute and tell us who you are and, uh, you know, and your background? Sure, Chris. Well, I'm a retired uh, Navy commander with uh, over 30 years experience in program and quality management. Uh, my last duty station, I was program manager for the Defense Communications Agency. And then I went to work for the IRS, uh, quality manager for Oracle's Emerging Technologies Group, where I also worked on process improvement for Oracle consultants. In uh, 1997, I started the Software Engineering Application Solutions Company, and I've had that ever since. We build applications for military and civilian federal government, and I've been developing and implementing quality systems for medical device companies since early 2006. That's awesome. And I'm going to slide through a couple of uh, what we do. As I mentioned, we're going to briefly review uh, the types of FDA recalls, uh, which type reflects the greatest patient risk, uh, the biggest contributing factors, which when you go to the recall FDA recall site, for every one of them, you'll see a note saying reason for recall. And we also, now we're going to show you as we get into this webinar, how to prevent FDA recalls for medical devices. And uh, as Charlie just mentioned, he's got a very strong background with process improvement. And here's the background on Charlie Gregg, you can see on the screen. And uh, as you can see, he has a lot of experience working with large medical device manufacturers and, and helping them get through problems that a lot of them experience. It seems pretty similar across the industry. And uh, his experience helps them also avoid um, product recalls. So uh, Charlie, when, when we see this slide right here and, and who we think this program is a lifesaver for, um, when you see the, the, the target audience, CTOs, VP of Engineering, in your experience, who, uh, who would benefit the most from this? I would say the, well, it's a collaborative thing. The, the uh, managers of engineering are, are really the important ones to, to uh, convince, but you also have to convince the, the, the CEOs and the CIOs <laughs> in order to get the money for it. But you have to have support throughout the organization. And uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're going to discuss the recall prevention process, but where do you see this as a value add for this process within the process improvement program that you have? Well, you know, in any company, medical device or other, uh, can benefit from this process. The process improvements that uh, we help companies achieve develop uh, devices that exceed customer satisfaction and reliability, whether you're producing infusion pumps, replacement joints, or just building a better mousetrap. Every organization will benefit from prioritizing the tasks that are the most cost beneficial in the long run. Awesome. And when we start looking at right here, the uh, as Charlie just explained, how the process improvement benefits companies, this is where the recall prevention process fits into the overall process improvement program. And, and Charlie, do you want to briefly explain uh, the bullets that we're seeing on the screen? Yeah, the, the collaborative identification of process improvement areas uh, provide the real cost benefit. You have to get the areas where, where companies are really hurting or where they can improve. And you're going to find that the companies kind of know this. Uh, if they need a little help, there are different, different techniques that we, you can use uh, to go through this. Uh, for example, looking at uh, uh, management review reports, looking at CAPAs, looking at internal audits to, to pinpoint where they're actually having problems. By doing that, companies are more willing to go ahead and say, yeah, we can, we can improve there, rather than just coming in with a, with a total redo of their system. Most people do not like that. And um, I know you mentioned uh, the other day, as far as um, uh, bullet number five, what is that the, the, the biggest benefit to you? The uh, cost of quality metrics are, are very useful not only in starting process improvement, but in having a continuous process improvement program. What you're doing is you're, you, you measure one or two things to begin with, and you add things as you're, as you're going along, and it really gives you an empirical 
readout as to what you're actually spending, not only in cost, but in time and effort and customer satisfaction or dissatisfaction. So it sounds like if they work with someone like you and they are able to, you know, determine all the gaps in the process and plug the holes and help them, whether the problem is uh, critical defects escape into production or there's too many costs or they want to shrink the time to market, it sounds like once you implement a program that helps them, this last bullet helps to make sure they don't fall back into bad habits or slide into uh, the behavior that got them in trouble in the first place. Yeah, that's, that's entirely correct. That's awesome. Well, now we're going to talk about the different FDA recall types. And uh, our, our concern is across all the recall types, but uh, especially number one, uh, there's a class one recall. And we're not going to go through all the details here, but you can see it on the screen. This information comes right from the FDA site. Um, but for me, anytime there's a, a, a potential cause of death, <laughs> that's kind of important that we want to make sure that doesn't happen. And right here, there's a, a website, and we'll have it shown here in a second, that listed the eight top reasons for uh, contributing factors for recalls. So we're, we just want to talk about a couple of them today to save time. Um, Charlie, would you mind mentioning what you, your experience has been when companies or teams rush through product testing? Yeah, rushing through the, the product testing uh, may help an organization meet an artificial timeline or goal, but it rarely contributes to, to meeting time to market goals. Uh, rushing, rushing often results in many unintended consequences. When tasks are started before all required inputs are completed, they're done at risk. Uh, it's like what they need to get done over again, costing uh, extra man hours, frustrating workers, delaying product release. Uh, examples of this are, would be requirements churn, coding churn, regression churn, etc. Doing, doing things over again is where people really lose, uh, again, not only the time, but you lose your enthusiasm. <laughs> I've yeah. seen to, to do that. Uh, as to faulty design also contributes to the results that I listed earlier. Faulty design is often caused by any one or all of the following. Uh, inadequate understanding of user needs, not fully integrating risk management into the design, uh, such as not fully identifying either product or process risks, their mitigations, or residual risks. The process risks are done more often than the, than the product risks. The unintended user actions and system response are often overlooked. Many of these non-user requirement-based issues can be identified and scenarios developed using your recall prevention technique. Using this technique enhances the organization's ability to root out the hidden corner cases. Uh, you also have lack of traceability, uh, changing system and subsystem architecture, and poor regression analysis and execution. And, it's, and it sounds to me like all of this folds in well together, the recall prevention process with your process improvement program. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a big part of it. I, you, can, you can take any one of the, the parts by themselves and get some benefit, but if you take, take the whole thing, you're, you're really covering the whole gamut of, of things and you end up with a, a good process to do it. Because in our experience, and I know you've seen this a lot, the majority, especially when you go through, you know, those of you that are watching this, go go to the FDA recall site after this webinar is done <laughs> and um, and check out the reason for recall. You're going to notice that the majority of them are caused by either abnormal system behavior or unexpected user interaction, which is what recall prevention process was designed to find those to mitigate those risks before release. And uh, Charlie, was there anything you wanted to, to go over regarding those uh those key contributors. Uh, I think, <clears throat> again, these are just some of the key contributors, but there, there are a lot of them, and you have to look at the, the overall process. Alrighty. And uh, the last thing I want to talk about before we dive into the nuts and bolts of our process is these are the what we consider the recall prevention benefits. And I just wanted to ask Charlie uh, to give his, uh, his thoughts on, on these bullets. Yeah, be being able to develop... Uh, devices using processes and procedures that support addressing all possible device issues potentially arising from both product and process uh, evolutions. Uh, again, you need to look at both sides of this, this thing to do that. And which one of these do you think ma means the most to, uh, to engineering leaders? Oh, uh, in your experience? In my experience, uh, dramatically reduce R&D maintenance and technical costs. But again, these things are all important to different 
places within the organization. Right, so in different companies. What you, what you want to avoid is customer dissatisfaction, however you can do that. Boy, you hit the nail on the head. We're going to take a quick break to thank our sponsors, and then we're going to dive right in to the recall prevention process. Tired of seeing your project timeline slide to the right month after month with no end in sight? Build your mission critical apps with all the major risks identified up front and during the project by utilizing Advantu's Risk ID Checklist. Don't be surprised again with continually delayed projects caused by unexpected challenges. Stay ahead of those release killers by knowing where all the critical risks are. The Risk ID Checklist helps you identify all the high-risk areas in the system so you can properly target those critical defects lurking in the code and mitigate all of them. This program will make you the company hero by helping you deliver on time, every time, without surprises. Try it out for free at advantu.com forward slash risk. That's spelled A-D-V-A-N-T-U dot com forward slash risk. Okay, and we're back. As you can see, we have the recall prevention process overview on the screen in front of you. And uh, I'm gonna give you the 10 second review. As we go through the process, it'll make more and more sense to you. But in essence, when we work with product development teams, we walk them through the product requirements showing where all the high risk areas are. Then we show them how to unearth the critical defects that are lurking in the code, which normal testing typically doesn't find by creating what-if scenarios for unusual behavior, and then we prioritize them so our testing can be focused on the highest impact, highest risk areas. This allows us to find those critical defects while not wasting time on low impact areas, which are usually covered well enough by FDA mandated requirements-based testing. This process is very good for revealing defects that unexpected user interactions typically cause which is why we call this our recall prevention process. So Charlie, are you ready to get started? Yeah, let's uh, go ahead, Chris. Alrighty, we're gonna go to step one. Here we go. And I'm gonna pop all these up and we can walk through them. So um, go, go ahead, Charlie. Uh, well, one of the, 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 where you really need to start is uh, identifying new functionality and addressing the user needs. When we're able to have these complete and well-defined, we're ready to start analyzing. If these are not as rock solid as they can be, we'll likely repeat the succeeding steps, and that costs us time. Uh, the farther we go down the development road, the more we need to repeat. Uh, and going back to uh, uh, quality uh, metrics, that will show you that, that you're, you're uh, redoing your, your time and effort. And the more we repeat, the more our cost benefit goes down and goes in the wrong direction. And I found, too, that when we do this step, I, I've used this in other projects, because um, I want to kind of test out the uh, theory to practice to confirm a, this process has been around a while, and we proved that it would work in the, in the medical device world. And we noticed that when we started going through all the products for new functionality, that it kind of um, illuminated everybody to what they either hadn't thought of or what they might have missed because they didn't take the time to read the requirements or they were kind of in a hurry when they wrote the specs. So this tended to kind of reveal issues right off the bat just with the, uh, I guess I'll call it the codeability or the testability of the requirements. So it seemed like a, a very helpful start uh, beyond just what we were looking for as far as recall prevention. And uh, as we mentioned here, who wants to say, you know, how on earth did we miss that? So let's go ahead and uh, move on to step two. And I'll let, go ahead and Charlie, I'll let you uh, go on from here. Yeah. Uh, first of all, we start uh, mapping user needs to product risks and product risks. And then both product risk mitigation and process rhythm mitigations are mapped to product requirements. Now, assuming we've identified all user needs and risk mitigations, 
we have a solid understanding of product requirements. The risk mitigations we added to the product requirements will be drivers in choosing the most beneficial architecture and ultimately the best design. And hopefully through this process, with, with our traceability so far, we will not have missed anything. That's awesome. And what's nice is, uh, just a one second here, is the first step we went through and made sure we were clearing all the requirements and now we're mapping the requirements for mis risk mitigation activities, we're mapping the requirements to the code so that now we know um, we're set for the next step. And now we're gonna to go to step three, which is mapping the mitigation activities to impacted design elements. And this is where it gets fun. And uh, uh, Charlie, go ahead, I'll let you go ahead and go. Okay, this is where in, in my observations working with companies where, where most organizations go awry because developers tend to get ahead of the situation here and start coding without, without fully understanding the requirements. So we're, we're looking to ensure that we actually design in all mitigation requirements and linking this then allows us to verify that the mitigations are correctly implemented and in fact, we mitigate what we intended to. And I was gonna ask you, Charlie, because uh, when we did this on one of the, the last projects that I worked on, um, because now we're looking at, uh, you know, we've identified the requirements and now we've mapped the requirements to the code. And now we know that when we're making changes to the code to say add new features, new requirements, new functionality, we wanna see if the changes to the code negatively impacted um, previously uh, functioning uh, features and, and functionality. So from all the projects that you've worked on for quite a while, how often do you see teams actually go through this step? Not very often, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. Most organizations only map product requirements to verification protocols and user needs to validation protocols. The design elements tend to get left out in there because it is perceived as being not necessary or, or too hard to, to do. Uh, doing this uh, gives you a false sense of security since verification is not able to actually verify that functionality was not designed in the device that was not intended to support a requirement. Another missing piece from not tracing to design is regression analysis and testing, becoming right. much more haphazard. Finally, if, if requirements are changed, it's likely that unknown relationships will be missed and new errors will be introduced. This was a big problem I pointed out to an organization a, a while ago. Their issue was that tests that had passed before uh, and then on subsequent builds were now failing. I asked the development manager if they conducted regression testing. His reply was, well, yes, we do. And I says, well, how do you go about that? He says, well, we test what was broken. And I says, that's, that's it. You can't just do that because you're, you're, you're breaking other things that, that are linked to that. And without the traceability, you don't, you don't know that. Isn't that funny? Because I noticed when I, uh, one of the first projects that I was, you know, running this process on and we get to this step where we would say, okay, we've, we know the requirements are solid. Now we've mapped the requirements to the code and now they want to add, you know, talking about adding these new features to an existing application. And so to me, it seemed rather logical. Okay. You're, you're touching the code. Let's check all the code around that area that you've touched to see if any of that functionality related to the code around what you touched has been negatively impacted. And like you just said, a lot of that could have been code or, or functionality that's already been covered by pre <laughs> previously written regression test cases. So they think there's nothing to worry about in that area when most likely that's gonna be the issue that bites you down the road. Isn't that right? That's right. Awesome. Let's see if, uh, let's see if step four starts to make this a little more clear for everybody. And now we're gonna prioritize the recall prevention testing, beginning with the high risk changes. And this to me is where, uh, what I like to tell people, this is the secret sauce. And that this is where it gets pretty exciting because then you start to understand why this works and why we're doing this. And, uh, and before Charlie mentioned this, I'd like to kind of review something from my experience with this. The first time I participated in this process on a project, that I wasn't running, but I was, in, you know, I was involved with how this recall prevention process worked. I didn't quite get it at first, but after we were finished, major lights started flashing in my mind. And to hear all the cross-functional groups that were contributing, and this is where I really saw the value add was who was in that meeting. 
And the first time I intended, a, I was involved in a project, I was a QA lead, and uh, the folks in charge of risk, identifying the risk with this project, they were making major changes to a previously functioning system. They brought in everybody involved with that project. Program management was there, project management, tech support, technical writers, uh, configuration management, and in this case, it would be quality and as well as clinical. And then of course, software engineering, software quality as expected, but you made sure you had everybody on the business side because the input from the real world, what the user is actually gonna do with this system or with this device, that was the input that made all of this work. That helped us define the issues that otherwise come up in a recall because it's something that happens in a hospital that they didn't anticipate and they didn't look for when they're building the device in the first place. And that's where this makes all the difference in the world. And so what I saw them do was, you went through all the steps that we just did. Here's the requirements. Okay, we're gonna walk through and identify all the high risk areas because these are all the changes are gonna be made. And now, now that we have all the, uh, the impacted code, which you know traces out to the new features and then all the features that surround those where there's potential changes that happen, then they walk through all the prioritizing, uh, excuse me, uh, creating the what if scenarios. Okay, if we make this change to the code, then the surrounding functions and features that could be impacted, um, let's go ahead and walk through all those um, perimeter features that could be impacted. And if a user goes through the system and they go ahead and they, they, they select that impacted feature just by using it because it's in the workflow, um, first it's okay if they select that feature that's now been affected by the new feature code changes, what's the impact to the, to the user or to the system? And if it's a high impact, like they now go to use this, this uh, previous existing function and now it's not working, okay, that's high impact. And if it's in their common workflow, there's a high probability they're gonna hit it. So that becomes on this chart, you can see a one out of a one to four when you eventually prioritize it. So then you go through and you have everybody in the room contribute these what if scenarios. Okay, the surrounding functionality was uh, feature B, feature C, feature D, and you ask everyone in the room, okay, what would happen if somebody hits it? You know, what could happen to that feature if it's been impacted? Oh, they could click it, it could stop working. Oh, they could click it and it takes too long to function. Or, or maybe it affects another feature that's integrated with it. And you go through that entire process and you get input from everybody in the room. And the project I was on, the, the guys in charge said, Everyone has to give 10 scenarios. And it was amazing how you would see someone from clinical say, oh, you know what? You know what, that could happen. Because this is how the, I know that the nurses will use that device in the hospital because the last time this product went out, that was the kappa that came in. And then someone on the nursing side will say, oh, well, don't forget this. And so the scenarios list would grow and grow and grow because someone in the room would say something and it would trigger someone else to go, oh, well, what about that? If you just had the R&D and QA team in the room, you would miss two thirds of what would happen in the real world. So the scenarios being contributed by everybody on the team, that that's the magic. And then you go through, as I mentioned, the prioritization. You know, what are the chances that they're gonna find it? Okay, let's say they, they negatively impacted by the code change for the new feature, something in the help section. Maybe the font color was, was skewed or something. Um, what are the chances someone's going to find it? Well, if they don't use the help section much, not very high probability they're going to find it. And if they do find it, well, it's not going to hurt anything, so the impact is really low. And you go through and you label all the scenarios with this process, and now you've been able to, as a team with logic, identify all the potential high impact areas in the system at this early stage, and you know where to focus all your time and then you don't have to waste time on the low impact areas because you've already determined even if something happens, it's not gonna hurt anything. So you can set that aside for the, uh, especially in a regulated world, uh, all the requirements-based testing that has to be done that will cover those low impact and low, uh, low risk um, uh, issues. And did you wanna mention anything on that, Charlie? No, that's, uh, that, that's really it. I would, would reiterate the, the uh, cross-functional teams meeting to get everybody from every aspect so you don't have siloed organizations that, that, that 
don't talk to, to each other and, and go back and forth. So you really, you really need to do that. And you mentioned uh, prioritizing the, 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 the testing. That doesn't mean you don't necessarily do the low, low hanging or the low uh, risk things. If you have time, you do that. You just don't waste time duplicating what's probably already being done in the requirements-based testing. And, and think about, I know you've seen this, uh, of all the projects that we've seen where they don't have a real strong process, and these are the teams that are usually um, in trouble. <laughs> and I've watched this at, at Fortune 100 companies, all the way down to startups, because they don't have a strong process, if they have to make a last minute change because of customer feedback or whatever they have to do, or maybe they found some critical defects near the end, they lose all that time they thought they were gonna gain by you know rushing to market because every time they do a new build, the entire company dives in and they test every square inch of this application every single time. And then near the end, they wanna send the release out and they're so terrified they're gonna miss something, everybody jumps in and tests every part of the system. And that always seemed like a huge time waster. And then they would do that and there would be very few defects and so they're always nervous, like, oh, my God, what's going to happen when this goes out? I think we miss some stuff. And then eventually, of course, the customers do when they release it. Yeah. So one, one, one other thing that I've seen like that, when, when you have uh, defects or issues that you can't resolve, uh, organizations go back and change the requirements. To, <laughs> to match the to, to match what the they have in, in doing that, then the user gets shortchanged, or uh, <laughs> especially if if marketing is just sticking with the the users, and and then you've got the development and quality side on the other side, and the two aren't aren't talking, and you're adding and subtracting, and marketing's promising this, but it doesn't get into the requirements, or uh, development says, well, we can't build that right now, we'll put that in the next release, so it's not going to be there. Everybody gets dissatisfied. <laughs> I've seen that too many times. Let's jump into uh, the next step. Thank you for that, Charlie. That would be step five, where we actually create the protocols uh, designed to uh, find those those hidden defects. And again, the secret sauce. So here's here's how it works. And I'll, uh, Charlie, could you go ahead and, as I've seen, you've seen this more than me, of how developers can actually utilize these high impact scenarios. Sure. Uh, by using the, the time to create protocols to test the high risk areas first, uh, as we mentioned before, organizations are able to maximize their testing time and effectiveness. Testing is initially directed at areas where the risk is greatest. As time permits, testing moves to the areas of lower risks. It just makes sense for prioritizing the way you're doing things. And then if you do run out of time, at least you're not going to miss any of the, the, high, the critical stuff. Correct. And as far as uh, software quality engineers, Again, it allows them to create the, the targeted negative test cases that are designed to uh, discover all the bad stuff. And that's, that's the fun part to me because then you know, you're, again, you're not going to miss anything. And now it's uh, time for the next slide. Here we go. And this is slide six. And what we like to call the value-added benefits, because uh, here, here's the typical problem. Go, go ahead, Charlie. Okay. Uh, first, first of all, uh, this uh, looking and analyzing your uh, residual risk is an ISO requirement. If risks are not mitigated as far as possible, then you're faced with two solutions. Continue to mitigate or document rationale as to why the product is safe to ship. If you do not evaluate how well the risks have been mitigated you're unable to make that decision and here's the solution that he's that charlie's talking about and uh I'll go ahead Charlie. again you, you, you concentrate your maximum focus on the high risk high impact areas and it provides uh dramatically greater potential for discovering the the defects that you otherwise would not have done and it's all through your your risk management and your risk mitigation and analyzing you know how well the risks have been addressed and here's something i i was thinking about last night because we we're getting ready for the webinar and what you just mentioned how often because i've sat again the last fortune 100 medical device company i worked with where i actually used this the recall prevention process successfully i sat in the the risk uh, mitigate, you know, the risk team meetings and, and went through all the requirements, decomposition, all the specifications. 
And when I sat in on the hazard review and the risk team, and I listened to how they, they conducted business, they followed regulations, they were compliant, <laughs> they followed the rules, and I watched them miss stuff, not because they were sloppy or didn't care, but they were simply following the rules and being compliant, but they weren't thinking out of the box. And I, was, I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's very true. <clears throat> you, can, you can execute every process you have and be compliant with everything and still have a, have a terrible product. Uh, keep in mind that every product that gets recalled was compliant when it was shipped. So being, being compliant is not necessarily what you want to do. Uh, you need to be compliant to the intent. What, what are you intending to, to do? If a task doesn't provide value, uh, don't do it or modify it to provide greater value. Uh, con conduct uh, evolutions from the perspective of what the intent is. And I, I give a little quick example of, of traffic lights. Okay, the, the traffic rules say that if the light is green, you can go. If it's yellow, you, you maybe go faster to get through there. And if it's red, you stop. How many, how many people stopped at a traffic light as soon as it turns green will go without looking right or left? Okay, the, the <laughs> yeah. intent is that you don't get hit, but you could, you could follow every traffic rule and get on an accident every day. So look, look at what the, the actual purpose is in, in what you're doing and, and make it add value. So wouldn't you say that if you're sitting at a light and it turns green and you go and someone runs into you, that would be unexpected behavior, it right? It sure would be. <laughs> <laughs> Painful, unexpected behavior. So we've gone through that process. Let's do, um, as you can see on the screen here, this is the overview. Let's go ahead and do a quick recap. And uh, and you can see all the steps. Charlie, did you want to cover this or do you want me to? Uh, go, go, go ahead and I'll chime in. Okay. And basically, this is, a, again, a recap of, of the process that we just walked you through. But essentially, your cross-functional, like Charlie said, the cross-functional team has reviewed and approved requirements, reviewed and approved risks and mitigations. You've created and maintained a complete traceability. You've identified, I want to underline it, all potentially impacted design elements. Then you've created the what-if scenarios for potentially impacted features and unexpected responses. You've prioritized and utilized all the high impact scenarios with the impact versus probability, which is such a huge time saver and it's such a, a great implement for focus. Then you've created the targeted negative test cases that focus on uncovering the unusual defects that are typically missed during functional and user testing, otherwise known as requirements-based testing. You've isolated, exposed, and mitigated the unexpected critical defects. You reduced your time to market through prioritized testing of high impact areas, dramatically reduced potential for critical defects and potential possible FDA recalls. And then you've updated your documentation supporting continuing process improvement. And Charlie? Yeah, uh, one other thing as far as helping to identify these un unintended uses or unintended consequences is to expand your human factors and usability studies. That's where you're going to find, find that out. How's the user actually going to use this and are they using it in the way that you designed it to be used? I remember I um, took my wife to the ER a few years ago. She just had a bad fever. And I remember sitting in the ER and uh, um, <laughs> one of the companies I was on a, doing contract work for um, had built the medical device that was attached to my wife. And it was just to get, you know, saline, just, just get fluids. And I could hear the alarm going because I could see the nurse on the other side of the bed, but her back was to me. She was hiding the medical device, the infusion device, and I kept hearing the alarm going, which meant that it wasn't doing what she was telling it to do. And then I finally heard, oh, damn it. And I heard her power it off, power it back on, and then it worked. So imagine if you had that little interaction, because I asked the nurse, does that happen often? She goes, oh yeah, that's, that's our workaround. We just restarted about half the time. I thought 50% failure rate right there. Imagine if they had talked to the nurses and gotten an idea how they really use these devices, because she had just brought it in and had been turned off for a while. But imagine if they had put that into human factors engineering and said, here's how it's really going to be used. She wouldn't have to, all the nurses wouldn't have to go through what they then commonly thought of as, oh, we just reboot it. Yeah, that, that, that brings up a good point about, about alarms. If they continually go off and you don't pay any attention to them, they're, they're of little value. Look at uh, car alarms. Uh, 
Yeah. How many times do you hear car alarms going off and people walk <laughs> right by and don't do a thing about it because so many of them are, are triggered by unexpected events and there's nothing actually happening. <laughs> a truck going by. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, now that we've finished the recap, um, I want to get into an area where, before I show it, this was something that, again, when I first saw this process at a company up in L.A., and they had an entire room, it must have been a good 500, no, about 2,000 square foot of room. It was huge, and it was nothing but wall-to-wall, -wall, floor to ceiling whiteboards. And they went through this entire process, and everything was left on the whiteboard until the project was done. And people could just walk back in and go, oh, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And once they get their part done, my deliverable, you know, my input to my activity is this. And then when I'm done, it's input to the next people on the team. So I need to get my part done. But the visualization, to be actually see the process of the project and where your focus is and how to avoid the risks, that to me seemed huge. And I wanted to, uh, I wanted to walk through how how you implemented this on all your process improvement gigs because it seemed critical and easier to explain, especially when you have people that are either they're offshore or they speak different languages and they don't understand what you're saying very well. Pictures seem like they worth a thousand words. Yeah, they do. Uh, pictures are, are better, uh, especially if they're up all the time. As people people <laughs> yeah. walk by them and, and, and look at that. Uh, the uh, recall prevention process flow. Uh, you can look at look at this, and you can see uh, the sequence of events or the sequence of predecessors and and successors in what you're doing. Uh, for example, uh, looking at the the new product PRD twenty three. Uh, you go down to risk zone three, and mitigation is required. You go over, and you have two different design elements, and you have uh, different different unit codes. Looking at uh, software requirement five, it goes over and it affects another software requirement two, which goes in. So by looking at this, you can see all the different things that are that are touched in there. So this this to most software engineers, they would look at this and go, oh, okay. So it looks like we're making changes to an existing application, and here's the new features and how they might impact previously uh, functioning. Uh, uh, code right right uh, uh, an example where this wasn't used was back uh, this was many many years ago on an old cobalt based system uh, it was when I was working for the IRS and they wanted to go in and replace it with a, with a new system because fixing the cobalt system was was impossible <laughs> that thing I would say 90% of the code in there was unusable and if you took one piece out something way over on the other side would break. And so there was there was really no reason to, to do that. So you end up with this big monstrosity of code that is totally unmaintainable to, to do that. So if you have traceability, you can go in and you can actually fix things. You right. decrease your code base, you increase customer satisfaction. Because you know where to look. Yep. And now we're gonna, uh, what I wanna do is talk about, we've been alluding to it uh, during this entire webinar is the process improvement program and Charlie is our expert, so I wanted to see if we could just briefly walk through uh, the process improvement program and where um, where the recall prevention process falls into it. Okay, as as Chris said, it covers the entire spectrum of, of what you're what we're doing from from beginning to end, and all parts are Im important. Uh, some people do some parts better than others, but if you if you improve and you do the best you can in, in all those parts, you're going to end up with a much better product, which comes back into the, the cost of quality metrics that you're doing. You can actually see where you're going to improve and you don't waste time going, going somewhere else. Uh, use common sense. Uh, if, if it doesn't make sense, it probably, <laughs> it probably doesn't uh, deserve being, being done. Uh, do things for the right reasons. Uh, you're, you're going to shrink your time to market. You're going to have more customer satisfaction. Uh, defects aren't going to be released. You're going to find things early. Uh, it, it's just a, a better overall overall thing. And ultimately, you're going to get greater market share, driven by the increased user satisfaction. Uh, coming down the chain would be preventing preventable recalls. 
continuing on again, you're going to decrease the time to market, followed by less frustration and the opportunity to concentrate uh, on, on more continual improvement in your processes. That's awesome. And so we're, looks like we're just about at the end of the webinar. And uh, as Charlie was explaining, the benefits of the process improvement program, because we just walked through, again, the recall prevention process, which is a part of the overall process improvement program. So for me, if you're tired of critical defects escaping a production, or your projects keep running late, they slide right further and further, uh, it, you know, and you're, you're kind of tired of fighting that demon because uh, what you're doing isn't working, and we've all been through it, Go ahead and reach out and ask us to set up a call with one of our process engineers. Or if you know you have challenges with your process, maybe you've had change in management, uh, people come and go, maybe domain knowledge walked out the door, um, maybe the company was bought by another one and they're not, their processes aren't as good as you thought, uh, let's go ahead and schedule a free assessment. We'll take a look at your software development and product delivery processes and let you know where the gaps are and then we can provide recommendations. And typically, as Charlie would tell you, they're incremental by nature. I've never run into a company, and I, I'm pretty sure Charlie hasn't, where everything was wrong. And there's nothing worse than some expert coming in saying, oh, everything's wrong, I gotta scrap it, start from scratch. Nobody has time for that. No one's gonna go along with it. Typically, there's a nuance, maybe there's a piece of the piece, or a part of the process is missing, or was implemented pro improperly, so finding those gaps and putting things together properly and getting them in the right sequence, um, getting the right people in the right, um, the right roles, it, it, it's a good blend of, of potential issues, but it's not gonna be the entire system. It's just a piece here, a piece there that Charlie is so used to looking at these processes and how companies operate. He can look at it and tell you what's missing and then we can work with you to put together a remediation plan that has minimal impact on your teams, on how your company operates, but boy, what a benefit to your bottom line when you can actually you know, accurately forecast timelines and your products go out on time and you're not having a lot of tech support costs because defects were found by your customers that really they shouldn't have, you guys should have found it earlier in the process and you know that, we know that, we just wanna come in and help you get past that. And so we wanna be able to help you meet those time to market and product quality goals. And literally at the end of the day, we want to help improve customer satisfaction with your product. So, so call today, and uh, and Charlie, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, just just to hit on on one very important point that you made about the about processes. Have your processes rock rock solid, because uh, as Chris said, uh, if if it's tribal knowledge and people leave, then your process falls apart. So you need to have it documented. You need to have everybody understand it. You need to follow it and you need to keep improving it. Just because something didn't work yesterday doesn't mean it won't work today or tomorrow. And just because you've tried it in the past and it failed doesn't mean that it will fail now. Things are really in flux, they change. Nothing is ever off the board. Right, and what we'd like to do is, in a typical engagement, do a gap analysis, you know, start with a free assessment and then perform an ex you know, a more extensive gap analysis. You, it's fun when we do these because then when you show the results to you know the decision makers, the folks that are in charge of making the changes, and they look at that and they go, oh my God. But most of the time, they're, they're not surprised. They just know that they don't have time to do everything because they have their own job. So imagine being able to focus on your company and, and how you do business and your customers while Charlie comes in and focuses on the process and he can help highlight the areas that are missing. And then we can work with you to put together a remediation plan that has the least impact on your operation and on your team, but really has a strong value-added benefit to um, your company's growth and your customer satisfaction moving forward. So we uh, appreciate your time today. Hope you get a lot out of it. And again, if you have any questions, shoot us an email. You can either contact Judy for a free assessment, or you can send a note to me at support at advantu.com. Uh, we always respond, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks for your time. Have a great day. Thanks, Charlie. Oh, thank you. Fun.